Welcome, bird nerds. Welcome, friends. I'm Grant Williams. This is The Bird Emergency, where I get the opportunity to talk to people who know far more about birds than I do. I'm just a humble bird nerd. And today, it's my pleasure to get to know Dr. Sally Bryant is in Tasmania and has a wealth of experience. Before I introduce you, Sally, I'll just step through it a little bit so the listeners can know that they um, should be paying attention. They should be paying attention and taking some notes. Uh, Sally, you did your PhD in the School of Zoology and before that, Bachelor of Science. So you are a scientist. 11 years as the Manager of Conservation Science and Planning at Tasmanian Land Conservancy, and we'll talk about what Tasmanian Land Conservancy is for those who don't know. You've been the director of Go Wild Tasmania, Bonnerong Wildlife Centre. I think people will know that name. And five years as the manager of Threatened Species Section at the Department of, let's shorthand it, Department of Conservation and Environment in the Tasmanian Government and You're also the manager of the fauna section before that. Currently, honorary research fellow, Tasmanian Land Conservancy, honorary editor of the Royal Society of Tasmania. Now, that's a big tick. The Royal Society is a bit of a big deal, I'm told. Island Arc Symposium. This is the really interesting thing about how important islands are. And is still the chair of the 40-spotted partalote National Recovery Team. I think that's enough. Hello, Sally. How are you? How do you wear all those hats? With pride, Grant, with pride. And there's still more to come. Look, it, how do I phrase this? I think I, I've often talked in the show about how you have to stand on the shoulders of giants to keep achieving things in the conservation and ecology space because you're building on prior knowledge. But knowledge in this area takes a long time to collect, assess, and then disseminate. So you need to have stickability, as my old school principal used to call it. You really need stickability to be able to make an impact. And you've certainly done that. Oh, the other thing I didn't mention, Tasmanian listeners will know you because you've spent the best part of 20 years doing a regular spot on ABC Radio talking about wildlife and no doubt, often about the threatened species of Tasmania. Has it look? Has it been hard sticking at it? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've worn you out already. <laughs> How did you get? Let Let's start with that experience with the ABC. How did that come about? And what was the feedback that you got over that twenty years from the audience? It started back in the nineties, Grant. I had uh, co-authored a book called The Threatened Fauna Handbook and we got some media publicity on the radio for that and people started to ring in and answer questions. And I guess my professional scope for fauna, which included birds, reptiles, the whole spectrum of species that occurred in Tasmania, made it a good fit for general knowledge questions. So that's how it started and it became a regular segment. It's still a fortnightly segment. It started off on breakfasts, then mornings. Now it's still running in the afternoons with Helen Shield and I really love that time slot and I love her style. And I think the success of the program, Grant, is not so much me or my response to questions but the fact that most people are so fascinated by wildlife and want to know more. So it's continued on for a long time and hopefully for more to come. There's a really good point to pick up because it's one of the things that I tend to get a bit bolshy about it. And and I think I've mentioned this saying to you once before, but you said that people really care about wildlife. I think we're at the point where it's really nice that you care. Now, what are you going to do about it? So Do you find that while everyone's interested and they like to know about the wildlife around them, do you think there's any more people who are going to actually take action and demand protection than there was 20 years ago? Bearing in mind that Tasmania has always been quite a a 
environmentally conscious and activist population, maybe not in the majority, but a significant proportion because of the, the Greens movement in Australia really started in Tasmania. We all know about Bob Brown and I think we know about the Franklin Dam. So do you think that has grown in, let's say, 20 years? I think it's definitely grown in 20 years. Tasmania is a great case study for the growth in the conservation understanding and the love for the environment. But Tasmania has changed and it's changing dramatically. And in those 20 years, we've gone from being the small backwater state to the most highly sought after place for people to come and live and enjoy nature, experience nature tourism. So it has, it's rapidly transformed in 20 years. We've had a whole cultural shift and a change in how we see ourselves and how we see our state. Education grant is a fundamental platform. I often think that for conservation, protecting habitat is a fundamental plank and education is a fundamental platform. But we have to go above and beyond education. And I think your point about are there more people that care? Yes, there's more people that care, but are they stepping up and doing and translating that care into positive action? I'd like to think yes, but is it fast enough or significant enough? I'm not sure. Obviously not if you look at the stats for conservation and species decline. No, and look, I hadn't really planned to go down this route, but I think it's really interesting to talk to you because you have been a communicator in the general sense, getting out, talking to the general public rather than just talking to the I don't know, I hate using the term. It's really easy to group people together, like the intelligentsia, the wildlife, the ecology, the biology club, so to speak. Do you think there's actually an an awareness of how bad, how dire the situation is for some of these icon species? One of the major lessons I've learned through the Wildlife Talkback Grant is burnout and turn off by people that see conservation as continually a bad news story and loss of hope. It's always about death and destruction. I used to laugh when I managed threatened species for the state government. It was always about death and destruction and loss. So I think people do become very worn and bitter and sometimes what you need are a few good news stories. The success of the wildlife talkback is keeping that talkback positive so that people stay engaged but trying to drop into the message. Some little gems about things you can do and changes you can make. And at the end of the day, what's transforming conservation consciousness is climate change because we've now moved into an era where we are thinking about large-scale impacts that 20, 30 years ago weren't on our radar, but now they are. And so people are a little bit more tuned in to some of the threats that are occurring at a much more rapid rate. Let's try and let's try and stay positive because sometimes I do get a bit doom and gloom because I'm I want everyone to hit the panic button not to to be saying that everything's bad but that we actually have to take action on the things that we know need to be done. So give give me a couple of glimmers of hope about your patch in Tasmania. What are some of the the positive steps that have been taken that have got real successful outcomes that we can point to and measure? The private land sector. My time with the Tasmanian Land Conservancy when I managed the science program and I'm still a research fellow there and very strongly connected to that organisation If you want a good news story and you want hope that in Tasmania there are organisations supported by people both on the ground, volunteers, philanthropists, backers, through smart business that are making positive and significant changes to the state of the environment in Tasmania, look in the private sector, look in the private conservation sector, all over Australia, the growth of the private conservation sector has set a new standard and shown government what is possible. That gives me hope. For people who are not familiar with how the private conservation 
sector works. Can are you happy to talk about the Tasmanian Land Conservancy and w- what it is, how it operates, and I don't know it, it, is it superior than the traditional government state park national park model? People can get onto the uh, website of the Tasmanian Land Conservancy grant and have a look at their latest annual report. So this little snapshot doesn't disclose anything that's not publicly available. But I think the Tasmania Land Conservancy is a model that demonstrates how innovation, quick thinking and looking at priorities and dealing with urgent action can actually transform into results because the Tasmania Land Conservancy was created in 2001. So they've only been around for, you know, 20 odd years. They've grown from a small organisation of a handful of volunteers and one or two staff to now being over 20-odd staff. The smart, savvy business model that they have means they're sustainable into the future. They have a business model that is based on a foundation fund and in 20 years, Grant, they've established now over $16 million in a capital fund that allows them to run the organisation and to grow the organisation. They have held campaigns for the acquisition of land and this is often land, private land that adjoins public reserves that acts as a corridor or a buffer or it holds threatened species that are otherwise not in public reserves. So their private land reserve system, which is now permanently protected by covenant, I think is about 25 reserves, stems 20,000 or more hectares. That's pretty impressive stuff. And it's done in collaboration with other partners, but it's also pure leadership and innovation. Now, with that significant amount of land being added to, we can't call it the national estate because it's not, is it? And in fact, one of the reserves of the Tasmanian Land Conservancy grant have World Heritage status. They're not small reserves. These are significant parcels of land. Yeah. All right. Let me pose a question and and invite you to give some opinion. The three of the top uh, four birds most likely to go extinct in Australia are Tasmanian, and not one of them is one of the species that we all know about or that frequently discuss, the swift parrot, the OBP, the orange-bellied parrot, and the 40-spotted partilote. The the top three are the King Island black currawong, the King Island scrub tit, and the King Island brown thornbill. Without, without some form of action involving private conservation organisations and practices, do you think that the top three and the others that we know about, the sort of Tasmanian icon species, have got a hope if they were only going to rely on public land acquisitions and protection. Let's talk about King Island. King Island has undergone massive land clearance grant. Anyone can look at a map of native habitat on King Island and you'll see that the majority of King Island is pasture. And that happened a long time ago. The King Island Thornbill, the King Island Scrub Tit, really reflected the spiral decline of very restricted species that continue to just plummet towards extinction. It's a miracle that we still have both of those species left on King Island. Now, while I'm demonstrating that the rise in private land conservation has demonstrated leadership and innovation. They can't do it alone. It is all about partnership. And the biggest kid on the block is the government. The biggest bankroll is the government and is in, as impressive as the Foundation Fund is for the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. It is the Tasmanian government and the Commonwealth government that can change species conservation overnight. But government is such a a fraught mechanism, it's not It's not proactive and it's not quick to react unless there's a dire emergency 
by which case it's often too late and throwing money at it is not going to bring about recovery or stop extinction. We really do need a new conversation about how we tackle environment because it's so obvious that what we are doing is not enough, it's not fast enough, and it is not working. So there's definitely time for a new conversation. That's one of the key things I wanted to talk to you about, Sally, because you've played in both sand pits. You've been a long-time employee and manager in the Department of Conservation slash Environment slash had they merged forestry and and agriculture into it when you were managing it? I mean, it and now being a, a, a manager and an advisor to a private group, do you think that the government side is ready for a new for a new conversation and a new way of doing things, or are they a, a fair way behind? Oh, they're a long way behind. And when I say government, Grant, I have to pay respect to the people in government, still some of my original colleagues. Government in Tasmania has some great staff committed to conservation, but it is the structure of government. It's the mechanism of government that is slow and not responsive. It's not proactive. So that's what we're talking about. Are they ready for a conversation? No, in Tasmania they're not. They definitely don't want a conversation. Coming from government and working there for many years, your mindset changes. You feel like you have control. You feel like your decisions are the right decisions. And it's not until you get out of government, you work in the private sector, a whole new perspective opens up. And for me, it was such a window of change. And that's where working together and the 40 Spotted Puddleite Recovery Program demonstrates that so well. Working together, you can achieve so much more. Government is not the mechanism to do that. And if I hark back to the conversation we started with on education, research, data, we know about the perils that face nature. We can continue the research and add the fine, finer detail and finer points. We know most of what we need to know to prevent extinctions. Is that Sorry, true? it's not somebody knocking at my door. That's the dog barking at the at the resident turtle doves. Dog, useful in con- <laughs> conservation. Dogs have risen to the fore. As- That's right. No, he he gets very annoyed when they come and sit on the roof or on the fence or in the kumquat tree. So he doesn't like them coming around. He does have a job to do. Look, returning to that issue about government, and I'm when I'm using the term government, I'm separating out all the foot soldiers who were actually employed in the department, collecting data, assessing surveys, writing the reports, you know building the fences, maintaining the tracks and the roads. That's not who I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the decision makers and the people mm. apportioning, apportioning resources, be they elected politicians or the high-ranking advisors and, and managers. Are they, how do I say this without being offensive, do you think they're good faith actors when it comes to conservation we know what species need to to be protected i might have to let him inside in a minute if he keeps going do you think we so we already know what the problems are in most cases we know what needs to be done to do protection at least to ensure survival we might not know how to grow the populations but we might be able to stop them reducing but when push comes to shove if there's a positive economic imperative somewhere to not do what's right, do you think the absolute decision makers really value wildlife? That's sorry if that's too sorry if that's a too too tough. I know it's complex. I'm really interested in your in your opinion because you've you've been on both sides of the fence. I think it'd be fair to say, Grant, that in politics the environment minister is not high in the pecking order. Whoever is selected as someone to look after the environment portfolio is often not the strongest politician in the group. If you look at the big portfolios, it's health, it's education, it's finance, 
it's business if you're given the environment portfolio it's a little bit of a poison chalice i'd see and isn't that a sad indictment on a system that distributes funding and allocates priorities for work where the environment isn't seen as a top priority i think that probably captures the fact that we're in a dire situation yes let me let me make you bigger than me i don't want I don't want to be. Oh, why isn't that working? Let's just let's just go on from from there. I think you. I think your answer highlights the thoughts I have. In that, even if you get a hero for the environment to be the minister for that portfolio, the party structure and parties as a whole still don't don't value the environment above economic. Yeah, ec- economic portfolios. I think you mentioned the big ones, finance, health, of course, is the social services one. I mean, nothing's bigger than the spending on health and on Centrelink, et cetera. Yeah, roads, infrastructure. And I'm not naive that you need to have economic drivers, but we do know how to do a lot of these things hand in hand, but they still don't seem to be done. Is that frustrating for you, Sally, having written lots of reports about what needs to be done and put in very clear pathways for success. We'll talk about the 40 spot in a bit more detail in in a few minutes, but do you get frustrated or even bitter or angry about the way things shake out? Of course you do. And when you work in government, your job is to provide advice, but whether they choose to take that advice or act on it is entirely their prerogative. But Your job is to provide the advice and so that should never change. You should also not be influenced by political pressure and that's very difficult sometimes in a government system and certainly when you work in threatened species where there's enormous pressure and stress and everything is almost an emergency, it's very important to remain clear, focused on what is best for conservation and for species recovery Where the government picks up on that, and most of the time they don't, is out of your control. You can choose to go into the private sector. You can choose to rally or protest or riot. And all of those mechanisms do and are really important. But as a public servant, that's your role. So I don't regret the years that I had in government. In fact, they were foundational years for me. And I wouldn't have changed what I wrote or how I operated. I guess the frustration is that the slowness of the system to change means I've spent 30 years doing that and now there's not another 30 years to creep forward. The rate of change is now so much faster. I don't have either personally or professionally another 30 years to try and change the system, so I need to be doing things far more smarter, far more proactively. I'm a little less careful about what I say. I really need to be a lot more alarmist because particularly with 40 spotted partalote, I don't know that we do have another 30 years left Mm for that species survival. We're fellow travellers there, uh, Sally. I love that you use that term that you you picked out, emergency, because, I mean, we're on the bird emergency. That's exactly the way I... I felt and feel when I started off this little venture in that I think you're quite right that it the incremental losses that we've seen since the 70s and the 80s now snowballing they're compounding and the idea that oh we haven't lost we've only lost 20% since the 70s now if we lose 20% of not very many all of a sudden the populations collapse and become non-viable. So, yeah, it's an emergency. And I'm glad you use that term because I don't think enough people really see how dire it is. Anyway, that's there's my insertion of opinion for, for now, Sally. Let, let's talk about the 40 spot. How big or how big, how small do you think the population is now And how does that compare to the last time that the recovery plan was published? The last recovery plan was published 
had a lifespan between 2006 and 2010, we are now rewriting a new recovery plan grant. So we hope to hold some workshops maybe next month and get uh, specialists involved and community input and have a new plan ready to go for the 40 spotted pilot. But that in itself, you know, demonstrates that there's huge lapses of time between viable plans and emerging new information. When we talk about how big is the population or how important is the population decline, I guess my perspective of working on this species since the 1990s and being handed the baton by Peter Brown, my boss, learning old school techniques like being out in the colonies, doing all of the monitoring and and research by call, has given me a good perspective on the population 30, 20, 10 years ago and now today. And I know without any hesitation, that the 40-spotted partilote is dramatically declining. We had a population in uh, the early 2000s of around 3,000 birds. That's a conservative estimate that Peter Brown and I would do the monitoring and come up with a population estimate because working in threatened species, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the rate of decline, total population size. Everybody wants to know how many are left. And it's actually... Very hard to answer that particular species is stretched across a number of colonies and a number of locations. It's hard without a formal monitoring or survey program that's regularly undertaken to be able to answer that with confidence. So even though I give my opinion, there may be others out there that would choose to disagree. But my estimate of the population now is that it would be around a thousand birds, maybe less and that nowhere in any of the colonies bar one on Bruni Island has increased, has got bigger. They are all in decline. So if I was talking about a company and we said that in the last 10 years, 15 years, said company has lost 75% of its value... (laughs) and does not have a clear strategy for improving its position, we'd be saying the board, the owners, and Mm, the managers must must Mm. be hopeless. So you you just mentioned that it's it's always about the numbers because that's what people can digest. But it's Mm. far more complex than that because it's all about the land holdings, the quality of the the land, the, the stands of vegetation that are on the land. Before we go down that path, give a, let's pretend I don't know what a 40-spotted partilote is, what it looks like, and, and how it lives. Just a rundown, 40-spotted partilotes for dummies. Think small. Think fairly drab-coloured. Think of a bird that lives and spends all of its time high in the foliage of eucalypts, in the waving leaves and branches. Think of a bird that doesn't call that often usually doesn't come low enough for you to see it and that 99% of people won't be able to identify it or pick it up when they're in the bush. That's probably the 40-spotted partilote. But on the other side of that description, it is a remarkable little bird. It is exquisite in appearance. It's tiny. We're talking 8 to 9 centimetres in size, weighs under 10 grams. It has evolved an intrinsic link to one eucalypt species. That's Eucalyptus viminalis or white gum in Tasmania. On the mainland, it's often referred to as managum. And it's like a lot of threatened species grant. This is the Achilles heel when you're a specialist that relies on a source that's provided by one attribute in the environment. It is your weak point. And for 40 spotted partilotes, that is the issue and that is why they are in such decline. But I'll just mention why they're so amazing in the animal kingdom is that compared to other partilote species, the 40 spotted partilote, which of course is endemic to Tasmania only, has a small overhang on its beak and it uses that overhang, tiny, to cut grooves 
in the branchlets and stems of white gum and it's from that damaged groove that a small droplet of manna is produced that the bird relies on. So we have a species that farms its own food and I think in the animal kingdom that is a very rare, unique trait. That's one thing that in in some ways it frustrates me about the communications in conservation, that unique behaviour, and neither of us are behavioural scientists, but I imagine that it's quite significant. We know that crows are smart. We know that they can develop behaviours to earn food rewards. We, we're we developing an understanding of cockatoos and ibis and brush turkey learning and developing behaviours in urban settings, and everyone's talking about that. But we've got an agricultural specialist in the bird world here, and just that behaviour makes it an important species, in, in my view. What do you think? I am biased, of course. It's an interesting conversation to be had because it takes me back to what we were saying earlier about government numbers. Yes, the 40 spot is unique, and in my mind it is the most important bird species that I'm now compelled to work for the rest of my life on. But is that what loving nature and caring for nature is all about? Is it to look for those points of difference? And when you work in Threatened Species Grant, you realise that the only hooks you have to change developments, to reject proposals, to put in objections, relies on the little hooks in legislation, those points of difference. But are we in this dilemma today because we only look for those hooks? Yes, the 40 spot is absolutely unique in the animal kingdom and deserves to be out there having its story told and to compel people to say how important it is. But aren't all species in nature important? Isn't that what we have to change our mindset about? As a threatened species research scientist, I live in a property south of Hobart that's full of non-threatened species that every day I'm learning from and they all have so much to teach us and it's so difficult sometimes to always have to rely on a hook and and it reminds me of a conversation I had last night from a person who rang about a wind farm proposal in the northwest of Tassie, a woman that I had a terrific conversation with, I've never met her, and her words to me in her conversation, she said, I know it's wrong, I can see it's wrong, and yet she's compelled to find flaws in legislation or hooks in legislation to try and put in objection. And maybe there are some, there's some things that we need to change about how we deal with the environment. One thing that, that always frustrates me is where we talk about development, where we always ascribe a number of jobs or of a value to a project or some economic activity. But what do you think the impact would be on Tasmanian tourism? that sector, if the Swifty, the Pardalote and the OBP were no more and that the habitat that they rely on has been denuded to the point that it's no longer special, it's not something that people from the mainland or for the rest of the world would come to see, especially to see, that's the point I make, they make a special trip. If everywhere is lovely rolling green hills and dairy farms or suburbs containing large hardware barns and strip shopping malls, who's coming? So That's a complex question, Grant, and there's a, a lot of layers on how you would respond to that. Tassie has a great influx of nature-based tourism. I would say that bird 
lovers and bird observers are a component of that and they're attracted to Tassie by our endemics and the hopes of seeing some of those rare species, including 40 spots. And the Bruni Island has been the focus of bird tours. But you forget Tassie has had major extinctions in the past. People don't come here and say, well, actually, I'm not going to go to Tassie because the thylacine's extinct or the Tasmanian emu's gone. If we lose the scrub tit and the King Island thornbill off, I don't know that people will stop going to King Island. Nature-based tourism is all about scenes. It's about boutique food. It's about fresh air. It's about seeing bush, knowing what's in that bush and how that bush is being managed is a whole level of complexity that I don't know. A lot of tourists go down that track. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're very complex arguments, but certainly money, the money that is injected into an economy through nature-based tourism, if that or a portion of that could be directed towards species conservation or community vegetation, community conservation, wouldn't that start to open up a whole new conversation about why people come? Yeah, that that idea of communities, vegetation communities and, and habitat generally, I think doesn't get pushed enough because we are then passing from that discussion we're talking about the numbers aren't we that there are there's this many native rats there's this many possums there's this many stems per hectare of this eucalypt and we we're assessing the quality of habitat by these whole lot of individual measurements and while they're important the intact habitat is infinitely more important than any one species component that, that dwells within it. And I think too often they're pulled apart rather than the discussion is ha- is had with the two elements at the forefront, if you can have two elements at the forefront. I guess one's always well, got to be at the, in front that, of them. Let's continue that thought using the 40-spotted pilot, which is a great case study for all sorts of discussions and habitat is a classic 30 years ago grant. We in government that started the recovery program, we felt that habitat protection was the basic plank of the conservation of this species and its future survival. And we worked tirelessly for, we still are really, for 30 years to protect the colonies of 40 spotted puddleite And we've been hugely successful. We've protected either in public or private conservation covenanted reserves about 90% of all known partilote colonies. And those colonies are still there today. They still have trees and there's still lines on the map saying those areas are protected. The quality of the habitat because the environment is changing so rapidly, is now starting to diminish and the health of the white gum and the deterioration in their capacity to produce high-quality manna is such that we now need to do far more. We need to be far more proactive. And if you have absolutely no funding, not a dollar, to try and spur that program forward, It's a huge ask and that's why we now need to go down the track of a new recovery program. Everyone is volunteering their time. I left the TLC so I could spend, you know, all of my time on the 40 Spot program. That's why we need to reinvigorate and rethink and reimagine what we need to do for the future because things are changing so rapidly. And There's that element of complexity in environments, in habitats, I'm probably going to be using the terms incorrectly, but I think what we fail to talk about is that habitats are always in a process of succession, that when you have an edge effect every time that something is cleared or new vegetation is introduced alongside a fence line or a new road is put in, just it's a natural process that over time, there's a noticeable change in that mm-hmm. habitat. 
And mm. each generation of people may not see that, but it can be evidenced in a number of ways. The seed bank in the, all the sorts of analysis that can be done with leaf tissue and plant material of all sorts now. So it's not good enough just to have a static protection of a habitat. Mm. You need to be able to have new habitat being developed, being reinvigorated. Our habitats have adapted to fire and a whole lot of other things Mm. and the 40 spot doesn't make it easy for itself because we haven't spoken about it but it's fiercely territorial so even if you have a stable colony correct Mm. me if i'm wrong here but my understanding is if you have a colony which is successful and stable it's continually driving the new recruits out and there's nowhere for them to go that is true but i'll put a but in there the colonies that have been protected are still there and the reason we still have the species surviving today is because of that foundational work. But don't misunderstand, Grant, we also did a lot of work around corridors for movement, linking, so that we could grow habitat. But we now need to be shifting birds. We need to be shifting them to where white gum is healthier. We need to start new colonies and translocation or supplementing with new stock is what we need to do. We need to be far more interventionist. We've had nest box program for the last 10 years that's now starting to give some really interesting data. We've got landholders erecting nest boxes and monitoring them. We've now got a monitoring program in place to look more closely at birds where they may be coming up in new areas. So you are correct. It is the basic life history and ecology of the partilote that makes it tricky to work on it. And some might sit back and say, hey, you protected 90% of the known colonies. What more do you want? We want a lot more because you don't just build a house and go and live in it and not expect to do maintenance. You don't just think that house is going to stay in place for the rest of your life without ever doing anything to it or patching the eaves or when the roof becomes loose or the walls start to crack or leak. There is so much work to be doing and that's what I mean about the mindset of nothing is ever finished. You can't just breed orange belly parrots in captivity and keep pumping them out and think that's going to solve the problem. There's a lot of information, good information, that tells us the directions we need to go to make sure the 40 spot, which is very tenacious for a tiny bird, and part of it's a very tenacious and hardy group of birds. So we <laughs> know what is needed to protect this species. We just need some resources and capacity to start doing it. And in terms of a bird which is about the size of a computer mouse but less <laughs> that's fat, that, that's right, yeah, certainly half the weight, but they're, they're tiny things but it, in their own sort of weight for age division, They're amazingly pugnacious. They're tenaciousness, Grant, that is the reason they are still here today. And they are a survivor. And with a little bit of help and proactive work from us, they will continue to survive. But that's got to happen now because they don't have 30 years to wait. Imagine if they were the, the same size as a rainbow lorikeet. Could you imagine a cage match between a, a partilote and a rainbow lorikeet? I reckon the bully boy lorikeet might have a, a match on his hands. A lot of the monitoring sites that uh, I do for 40 Spots Grant are now full of rainbow lorikeet. It's such a an invasive species in Tasmania. It has just dominated the southern areas and the sectors it's on Bruni Island now it's on the southeast of Tassie all down Tinderbox Peninsula Kingston House picking it up on Mariah it's on Flinders Island it it is so successful those traits are are very dominating we probably need to talk about that in a different in a different episode because that puts different pressures on I'm not sure whether it's the 40 spot but certainly I would imagine that birds like the swift parrot could be driven out of prime Thank habitat you. by yeah. yeah yeah but let's talk about some of those 
particular aspects of conservation with the 40 spot that you, you talked about. Let's talk about nest boxes to start with. Nest box, production, design, placement in the environment and monitoring. You you touched on all of those. Can you tell us which bits are important, which bits have been successful and what's, what do you see will be growing in the future? Let's again look at the rainbow. Well, nest boxes, let's let's talk about nest boxes and 40 spots. We've really ramped up the nest box program for 40 spots. And in the early days, I have to admit, I never thought hollows would be a limiting factor for a tiny bird. Even with dieback or broken limbs on white gum or any eucalypts, I felt there were plenty of hollows for 40 spots, but that's uh, that's not the case. And we have really proliferated the number of nest boxes that landholders now with protected colonies are establishing. The actual design is now well proven. The quality, we're spruiking that boxes have got to be the best quality, how they're attached, and then collecting the data. So that's a a big thrust of our new recovery program and that's what we're doing as volunteers and I run workshops and I particularly run workshops for land for wildlife property holders that are already conservation focused. The thing with 40 spots is you can put up nest boxes in potential habitat, but you really need them in existing colonies because that's how they expand. So you've got to get them used to using nest boxes. It can take some time. So people will often put up a nest box and say, wow, nothing's using my nest box. This is a real downer. But you've got to be patient. They're a great educational tool as well. Can I ask you there, Sally, how long does a hard light live like what's what's the length of time of a generation and do they need to do they need to learn to use nest boxes all of that the learning is probably true but if you put nest boxes in known colonies and we've demonstrated this on Bruni Island all of the original nest boxes were put in our most viable colonies and it took a little while for the birds to take them up but once they did take them up then they rapidly increased in use because that was a learned behaviour and juveniles that probably fledged from boxes would have been more likely to breed in boxes. But it's only more recently that we've had banding work through nest box installation that we have learned so much more. And in terms of longevity, some of the early banding work in the early suggested that 40 spots could live somewhere between 12 and 20 years, which is a, a really long time for a small bird. So that's several generations. They're, they're quite hardy and stable, but it hasn't been until quite recently that we've had any returns on bands or been able to get any idea of longevity. Once juveniles disperse, they may not come back to the natal colony, so they can be very hard to pick up. And even seeing them with a leg band is uh, tricky given their size. Something I wanted to ask you as a result of what you told us then the monitoring of boxes is that monitoring the placement of box of boxes and the ongoing monitoring perhaps the most expensive part of of the conservation effort apart from land purchases but not just anybody can get high up in a tree and hang a box and then collect data so it is that a limiting factor in the ongoing conservation efforts like what sort of proportion um, of a budget would 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 that be because it always comes down to dollars we got to talk about the numbers of the population but then there's that management of the population Mm. which is a limiting factor for decision makers i I imagine so well we we can talk about the dollars because that's a very short conversation Uh, there is no money there's no money okay but you can actually do a with nothing for a short amount of time. It's not sustainable. My energy is wearing thin. But in terms of boxes, Grant, Bruni Island is a terrific example of the men's shed that build boxes and supply them to the Bruni Island Environmental Network. Landholders pay a small amount for a box, but you're right, it's a specialist skill to install the box. We run workshops and there have been small grants to employ arborists and professional tree climbers to put boxes up for landholders, often an extension ladder to cut it. We don't want any other deaths while we're trying to save this species. So you're right. 
when you don't have money and you don't have funding, it's hugely problematic. And this box is about one tool. As I said before, and I haven't really mentioned the perilous state of birds on Flinders, we need actions to be restocking. So we need a translocation plan. We need project staff. We need to be consolidating data and getting information out there. We need the whole recovery program to be ticking along as a well-oiled machine. But it's hugely difficult when you're relying on volunteers who give so valiantly and freely of their time and expertise you also need money, and uh, that's firmly on my radar for this year. The volunteers needed highly skilled, and certainly the tree climbers and, and arborists in high demand doing other jobs. So it's asking a lot for somebody to be involved in the, the program because hanging the box is only the first part of the story, isn't it? You, you need to be collecting the data to keep learning and then you need to be doing pest control and, mm. and things like that if required. So it's not like someone can... to land is all about, though, and isn't oh, that a fundamental absolutely. place of the success of the Land for Wildlife programs? You've got people that live on the land, that care about the land and are willing to do what is needed to look after those species. So covenanted properties on private land and land for wildlife program gives you a repository of people that are already on board and willing to assist. Now, that's not saying they don't need some financial assistance. If we had financial assistance to help, it would be even better, but at least we do have some basic yeah. actions I mean, it's amazing that so many people are always involved but it highlights one of the problems that is developing in government in societies like ours in all walks of life we are now even though the tax take continues to increase the reliance on volunteers in all areas of service delivery is growing so you've got to think that the government is actually being less effective with a greater take of the of the money, which... They... Well, two of my observations in recent times, Grant, and that is the stigma surrounding the word retired and volunteer. And there's a lot of negativity because, actually, I should have also mentioned citizen science. There's three elements there that carry a lot of stigma. If you're a volunteer... It's almost like you're giving freely of your time, but it's a job that paid professionals really haven't got time to do. Therefore, it's a diminished job. If you're retired, then somehow you have the crocheted rug and you're brain dead and you really haven't got much to contribute. That's another myth. And citizen science, the growth in data collection and citizen science. So I use nest boxes on private land, but also our monitoring program and the collation of data that comes from using motion sensor cameras, it is long overdue where we have not been engaging people in collecting data because it's sat in the realm of professional sites that have guarded data and not shared data because they need to publish scientific papers or research reports, and I was one of them. Now data collection and the simplicity of making sure that information is given and handed out and used to the best of species conservation. Three areas that we really need to be ramping up and change the, the stigma surrounding them. Sally, if you've listened to any of the shows already, you'd know that I'm a great lover of citizen science. I think, I think what Wedgie, what Claire's been building up there is terrific and there's the bird count. Canada have just had theirs. New Zealand have had one. India. Been... It's so good that the data is being collected and that is being shared widely and that new people are being getting involved in ongoing conservation efforts and they can look back and see the story and they can see whether it's a good story or a not so good story and what needs to change. So that's a key plank of conservation. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because the more volunteers you have and the more citizen scientists you have, the more government says, what do we need to pay for anything for? Mm. Uh, which So what's the answer to that, Grant? Do we do nothing? 
and then blame the government when a species goes extinct because they didn't give us any money. No, no. We, we do what we're doing now. We get mad as hell. We do what we can. And, yeah. And it does open up a conversation if I just butt in there again and I'm conscious that we've probably outrun our time. But the instability of funding has been another disaster in the conservation sector. Most people working on short-term contracts, research programs in academic institutions that don't go beyond two or three years, that lack of certainty and stability in funding is a curse and you can't survive any long-term program without secure funding. You can't run a business without that. And I mentioned the TLC and the way it generates its own money through innovative business programs and its economic model. We need to really shift uh, the way we fund Conservation Australia. Maybe we need a foundation fund that sits outside of that is contributed to by the population that provides a bucket of money that can grow through business investment but fund programs as well in long in a long term fashion. There's a lot of these conversations. They're not new. They haven't had traction but it doesn't mean they're not good. I think I think people don't understand how little money is spent on conservation and how little money it would take to actually make a big difference. Now, I'm working off memory, but I think in the recovery plan that you largely put together, Sally, the, the actions to that were required to, a, a, as was known and when the recovery plan for the 40 spot was put together was going to cost something like $270,000 a year. That's two and a half wages for a junior accountant. So that's less than the cost that it takes to, well, probably less than the cost that it takes to operate a milk bar, the corner milk bar. When you look at it like that, we, we have obligations under legislation to do the protection. But You've just told us, Sally, there is no money for the placement of nest boxes which work and there's no money for from the government to buy habitat and protect it. Now, I don't know how many hectares you could buy for 270000 a year, but I'm imagining you could probably expand it by... 10 or 15 hectares annually. I don't know. But that's a lot of seedlings that could be bought. That's a lot of revegetation that could be done on denuded land that adjoins good habitat. I think, Grant, you know, project offices are key to running programs. In the early days of the Tasmanian government, there were really, not the early days, in the 20s and until recently, there's, a, there's really only been funding for devil, orange belly parrot, And early on we had fox money, but 90% of everything else gets nothing. You've got those key drivers, and I'm not, I'm certainly not suggesting that the money that goes towards the orange belly is not well deserved. In fact, more. The more you throw at the orange belly parrot, the more you need. And it's typical of if you've got a well run program that's achieving results, it does cost money. And I, I don't know why we don't fund some of those recovery actions because with 40 spot grant a lot of the land protection and colony protection that we've achieved for one species also protects swift parrot all of the land protected on bruni island most of it is full of blue gum protects swift parrot it's not just a single species recovery program there's a lot of dual benefits what frustrates me a little bit sally when we talk about the sort of higher level conservation efforts needed is that we don't have champions in the in the administrative and the political stratas we don't see anyone coming out and saying i'm like who's the politician who is the champion of the 40 spot or the swift parrot that but there'd be plenty of them willing to say i help save the bilby or the numbat or i'm sure there'll be people jumping on board saying Without me, we probably might not have saved the Tasmanian devil from the face tumour. I don't know. what. Why is it that so few people are prepared to, in, in, in that strata of society, are prepared to hitch themselves to 
an icon species for an island state? They will in the future, Grant. They will. It's evolving. And as I said, we need a whole cultural shift and mindset in how we look at conservation and how we value nature and the environment. And to me, you know, it's an, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's fundamental to the way I live. It brings great joy living close to species, seeing nature unfold in your backyard, knowing that you're doing good, knowing that you're protecting. I don't understand why it's not a fundamental plank of how we live in Tasmania, Mm. and yet Mm. the disconnect is enormous. Yes, I want money for 40 spotted partilote. I'm thinking of all those shorebirds who are going to hit the wind turbines on Robins. I'm thinking of the shorebirds that are trying to nest on the beaches when people and dogs and horses and big four-wheel drives and, and road bikes and are going up and down sandy beaches. And I'm thinking it's huge. It is huge. But it's a mindset shift. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it's going to take more extinctions. It's going to take the loss of habitats or it's going to take people like me to put our hand up and say we lost the battle i'm gonna just withdraw from conservation work and just open another bottle of champagne and enjoy the years i've got left and not have it as a huge weight on my mind that- no we're, we're not giving up yet look I'm, I'm always reminded of that scene in monty python and the holy grail well i feel like the conservation warriors with a public profile are like the knight who is saying, it's only a flesh wound. It's one arm goes off and one arm goes off and then the leg goes off. But hopefully with the advances in surgery, the knight can get up and walk walk away these days. And hopefully we're going to get to the stage where enough of the community informed enough that they're also on board. Because that issue you talked about with beaches and horses and four-wheel drives and dogs most of those people are, would probably be sympathetic if they had any idea of the damage that is being done. The powers that be, like the, the conservation department, for want of a bit the correct term, they're not, they're not telling people what is on the beach and what needs to be looked out for because they probably don't have the money for the signage and they, they certainly don't have the money for a ranger an educational communication ranger to be on the beach on Saturdays and Sundays when the recreational tourists are around to talk to them because well, the overtime. Soft options, didn't we? Started with yeah. the soft options of yep. education, which takes generations to filter through. You don't need signage. Just signage, the proliferation of signage. Just who reads that stuff? But that, that, you know, that's that's my point. Read the, it are the ones that already know the message. Yeah. Do we need more brochures? It's never no, been easier, that, Grant, that, to the web. There is my, so my, much information out there. It really is that if they invested in people, if they invested in people like you, and like your fellow travellers who have the knowledge and the experience, to actually pay them to be out there on weekends talking to people and saying, hey, this is a prime nesting spot for hood- for, for hoodies. Or, But the last thing anyone's ever going to pay for is people because it's expensive. It's harder. It's harder oh, than putting up a sign. How interesting is that? I remember when COVID hit, Grant, it's almost as if the government were printing money yep. came well, from everywhere. Where did that, that money But that's the point, is that we don't see the value in the environment around us unless we can directly tie that spot of ground and that activity that happens on it to a specific economic outcome. We're not looking holistically, and, and I think that's and really the flaw. point. It's that, a flaw in the human species, yeah. isn't it, because greed and driven by economics, not understanding well, we, what sustainable means or putting any of those points into practice. It's a flaw in the human psyche, and it's, yeah, it's causing our own demise, really, isn't it? Yeah, but we get pretty lazy, too, in that we like to think that it's for somebody else to do the job. And no, I'm sorry, if you're listening, if you're listening or you're watching, it's your bloody job to save the species. It's not Sally's job. Sally's done her job for 30 years. Cat Young is doing her job now. The the people organising the festivals on King Island and Bruny Island, 
are doing their jobs. They've been doing their jobs. Now it's your bloody time to do your job and agitate, get involved, educate yourself, write a letter. If you're angry about it, do something. Don't be one of these dickheads who 15 years down the track goes, gee, I wish someone did something about the swift parrot. Oh, I wish I had a, or, or be one of those bird watchers who goes, oh, I wish I saw a swift parrot before they were gone. Don't just wish it. Write a bloody letter. Go to a meeting. Go to a protest. Paint a sign on the side of a building. I don't know. Do, do something because it's really nice that you care, but do something. There we are. This message was written and authorised. Sally, what, what have I missed in our discussion about 40 spots that, that we really need to take on? I'm really interested in Bruny Island in that it's the largest population still of 40 spots, intact population. Uh, Mariah Island is, so between Mariah and Bruny, Grant, that's 99% yep. of the population. She, and And in some of the material I was reading, one third of the population of swift parrots relies on Bruny Island. Would that be still correct? Yes, yeah, certainly Bruny is a repository for Swifties. You now, the difficulty with Swifties is they follow the flowering eucalypt. Mm, mm. So, unlike 40 spots that are relatively sedentary, particularly through the breeding season, Swifties are only there when it's flowering. Yeah. Those permanent reserves are a good basis to the conservation but really you don't need lines on a map you just need to protect and not cut down old trees and of course swift parrots um, follow the blossoms as you said which mm -hmm. means they migrate to the mainland where they need the box woodland habitats and the uh, those flowering eucalypts and of course we're cutting them down clearing the the land at a rate of knots on the mainland which means that they might have a successful breeding season in Tasmania where you guys might be doing the right thing on maintaining those island strongholds and then they come up here and they starve. So um, good job, people. There's another recovery yeah. action that we could be looking at with both Swifties and 40 Spots and that's supplementary feeding. And it pains me to say that, but we need to become more interventionist. And with 40 Spots, we've now looked at the chemical composition of manna so we can recreate an artificial formula to mimic the manna and what it provides during the breeding season. So we could do some supplementary feeding if white gum are not producing enough food due to their own poor health, we can maybe start to assist that threat and try and reduce that threat, I should say. Well, there's probably a whole lot more that we could we could talk about with those ongoing efforts, I think, Sally. But I just want to ask you about a couple of couple of the other threats to all of the birds we've been talking about. Let's talk about cats. What's the situation with cats in those stronghold areas of let's include those two species, uh, the forty spots and the swifties? Feral cats or even domestic cats are a huge problem on Tasmania's native species but for 40 spots grant they're not a big threat and that is purely because 40 spots and most pardalites are foliage gleaners and they nest high above the ground and they live most of the time foraging in canopies of eucalypts so it's not an easy spot for cats to predate them but that doesn't diminish the conversation that should be had about getting rid of feral cats from the environment because their impact is hugely significant on small mammals and other bird species that do nest close to the ground. While I was trawling through all the information on the ABC has been really supportive of getting the message out over the years for Tasmanian birds, but possums and sugar gliders came up often discussion points for being threats to nestlings now, I know that it's not so much with the 40 spot, but is, is predation by other native animals that doesn't seem to be a part of the normal run of things, is that still a problem for, let's say, let's say Swifties particularly? My understanding of the Swift parrots is that motion sensor cameras have definitely picked up the huge competition and predation by sugar gliders, which were introduced to Tasmania. We've got good evidence that demonstrates sugar gliders were brought in 
the early days of European colonisation. That's well and truly been confirmed. For the difference with 40 spots is, again, I mentioned that they breed often in small diameter holes, which are too small for sugar gliders. It's likely that they can predate on any nestlings, not just swift parrots or 40 spots, but they're very gregarious and uh, predatory little possum sugar gliders. So whatever cavity they can get into, they'll turf out what is there. Brush tail possums is a different conversation. Brush tails are a whole different competitor in the landscape. They're hugely successful, very smart. Yes, they predate nestlings and chicks, but it's not the major part of their diet. And so Again, I don't have camera evidence that demonstrates that brush tail possums have had a major in 40 spotted puddleote. We could mention that 40 spots have a parasitic fly that infests nestlings and causes the death of nestlings, and that's been confirmed now using nest boxes with cameras and checking. So as the temperature increases and fly strike increases on puddleote chicks, That is an increasing threat that needs to be looked at and there's some very innovative research underway with feather dispensers and looking at disinfecting the use of the interiors of nest boxes to prevent or reduce fly strike. There's a lot of gaps to be filled in and we've got great technology now. We've got scopes, we've got motion sensor cameras, we've got nest boxes that can be checked and birds banded and videoed. So we are learning a lot more about those intimate. There's so many more things to talk about, Kate. I, I'm really interested in the the idea of disinfecting the, the nest boxes while they're being populated. That's that's a big step, isn't it? That's a really big step. Costly mm-hmm. too, I would imagine, per box. So then we should be putting a value on each nestling. Yep, yep. yep. And you could, you could uh, convert that into the tourism industry. How many bird watchers come here to see our endemics? That, what what economic value does that bring into the state and how much per bird would that be? You can do all yeah, of that. We do need to do that and perhaps we can have another discussion about that when we've done a bit more homework about maybe the methods that could be used because I think there's a whole, there's a range of different ways that it could be done. Then well, we'd have to see who would accept it. Yeah, that's credits. right. Absolutely. Part of like credits. I, I, I like that. I like Worth that. Big- yeah, Sally, are you optimistic about the next, let's give it a 10-year window for the endemic Tasmanian threatened species? Tassie has some good stuff going for it. We've got a terrific reserve system. We've got good private land reserves. We've got a growing conservation landholder community. That gives me hope, but what we have is a changing climate which will bring with it a whole new range of threats, including more severe fire. And when you're working on an island-based species, Flinders, Mariah, Bruni, we're hanging on a, a fine thread in case of a wildfire. And I think the example of Kangaroo Island fire and other fires around Australia has demonstrated how easily you can lose a significant portion of your population. And that's why being proactive now is so important, dispersing birds, establishing new colonies, defraying the risk in case of stochastic events. All of those actions are so important. Ask me in 10 years, Grant, and it'll be interesting to know how our birds are faring. Not many, in my understanding, are actually going up in number. Some of the problem species are but not many of our native birds, certainly the monitoring by BirdLife, Taz, that's been spearheaded by Mike Newman is showing rapid decline in species that we thought were common and widespread. So it's not a story that's unique to Tasmania. It's a story that's been demonstrated in the Bird Action Plan and it's a story that's unfolding across the whole of our country. And that's actually the origin story of of the bird emergency, Sally, is that I just noticed around me that the birds that used to be common just around me were no longer common, that hearing a butcher bird was a rarity. Hopefully we'll be able to say that there was some arrest in the decline in in 10 years' time when we do have this conversation again and, and we're all smiles. 
Now, Sally, I always run my guests through a standard series of questions. Buckle up, get ready, and let's go with the bird emergency questions. I don't do them in any, any particular order. So let, let's start with what's your favourite bird? Start with the heart. Can I have two? You can have And a, Tasmanian native hen. I love native hens. Fabulous species. I have two. The native hen declining in in numbers rapidly or no good so there's a good news story one of your favorite birds is not in decline what's your bucket list bird one i've already ticked or one i need to tick look you can have one one. you can have one of each cuddling a kakapo when i did some research in new zealand was pretty fabulous i still remember holding smoko when he needed his harness changed put a new data logger on and feeling his belly was like a bowl of jelly. Wow, what a species. Mm. Flamingos. I'd really like to see some pink flamingos in the wild. I have seen some in Sri Lanka, but they were in a distant heat haze. So give me some pink flamingos for my future tick list. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? And what's your favourite birdwatching location? My backyard. Your backyard? I, what? My backyard on the slopes of Kunani, Mount Wellington. What, what makes it so congenial to bird watching? I really don't even need to watch. If the windows or doors are open, the bird coming in, it's a corridor for movement. It is just a symphony of bird sound. There's always action. It's always alive with birds and it is just a joy to live in an environment where you've got birds coming and going and giving you a little touch along most of the time. Have you got a couple of regular friends in your garden that you... um, Grey shrike thrush that have bred under my veranda and I've uh, set cameras on them. Learned a lot actually about grey shrike thrush breeding. I've had spotteds breeding in the bank this year. I've got native hens breeding in my little dam. Great goshawks regularly come and perch and whip off the native hen chicks without me looking. Lots of green rosellas, wedgies, brown falcons. I've got a monitoring uh, site here on the Bird Data app, and if I can't get 25 per 20-minute count, something's wrong. Gee, sounds like doing a couple of laps of your backyard would get you a pretty uh-huh. high score on, on Bird a Minute. Have you? Are you up on Bird a Minute yet? Sally? No, I'm not, and um, I don't use eBird either. I really, I really love the sound. All of my work is done by call. But just uh, chill out and let it ooze in through the ears and into the brain yeah. and into the heart. That's almost the next the next question. Are you a ticker or a flicker? I think you've you're probably both, aren't you? But you're ticking off your list, but you're also an experiential bird watcher. I did an organised bird trip to Sri Lanka a couple of years ago with a good friend of mine. It's the first bird tour that I've been on and it was an amazing learning experience. I'll never do another one because (laughs) the rate of seeing new birds was phenomenal. It it was both an incredible experience but a horror because that's not what I find fulfills my need to see see birds I can see common species I just need a glimpse of something now and again or to hear something so I guess I'm like most bird lovers I love to see new species but I love an intimate moment and time to reflect and understand what it is I'm looking at and what I need to remember from that moment and what's your bucket list location for going bird oh I've been lucky and I'm a bit of an island junkie try to get three islands in a year I've done a lot of islands around Australia including the Paradise Islands, Lord Howe, Norfolk, been to Christmas Island, but a lot of islands in Tasmania that most people wouldn't get to, a lot of remote islands, but also a little bit of work in New Guinea. That was pretty special. Sri Lanka, birding in Bhutan was really terrific. We've been to Nepal, birded there. I've got a lot to see, a lot to go. Europe, birded all through England and Scotland, and I'd love to go to Africa. There's so much I love to see all the world. There's so much learning, Grant. I'm no different to most people. Travel, new experiences and just an occasional new sighting is what 
trying well, to. I think what that tells us is that you're going to need a very big bucket. Seeing peacock <laughs> in India was a big tick, as uh, we were chatting about before we started. They are yeah. simply stunning when they display it. Yeah, that's just such a heart stopper. So every moment, birds are just a total joy. How everybody on the planet doesn't love and engage with birds is beyond me. They're, they're weirdos, the ones that don't. <laughs> Kate, what? I've done it again. Why am I doing that? I've done it again. Someone, you're going to have to really kick my bum when I do get down there, Sally. What's your favourite piece of kit when you're out in the field? Binoculars, I have to say that. The only thing I need in the field are my ears, really. I just need to hear. I've got a lot better over the years at processing sound. In fact, you never turn your ears off. They're always open, so... Hearing birds, frogs, hearing the sound of nature is actually fundamental to my research work. It's been fundamental to the work I've done at the TLC. So I'm not very big on equipment. I don't carry scopes. I've got a nice little pair of binoculars. When we're doing monitoring for 40 spots, we do a little bit of... So I've got a little Bluetooth speaker. But no, I'm not a gear junkie. I don't actually have anything. Just a little old bag with a few rips in the bottom and my bins. And my ears, and I'm really low maintenance, cheap to take out, actually. I'll be looking forward to your invitation when you're down here, Grant. I'm looking forward to coming down. I'm like everyone, I think, at this time of uh, very reluctant to go too far from home at the moment because you never know what will happen and what the consequences of travel might be at this point in time. But, Sally, here's the controversial question. What's your field guide of choice? I get asked to take a lot of people out now to see 40 spots. I mean, it's constant because they want to tick them off their list. And what I find is as soon as we go out, they're using their phones with apps and they're using Morecambe. They're playing bird calls. What was that, Sally? And I'll go to tell them and they'll be looking for the call. So I've got I've got a very old version of uh, Slater. It's a little slim green volume. sits in the pocket of my backpack. That's what I use. I write in it. I use it as a notebook. It's well out of date. But if I want to check on taxonomy or anything newer, the old days I would have used Hansab, but now there's so much information available. That's the one. I love that. (laughs) It's got an easy index in the back. So that's my field guide of choice. I don't know that I'm going to get a lot of ticks from younger (laughs) people on that version. Let's reminisce a little bit there, Sally. Did you have the part one and part two of the previous Peter Slater guide? No, I didn't. I've only ever had yeah. one. Uh, I did was... have a lovely field guide uh, that m- one of my partners gave me. But when we split up, I put that in a plastic bag and put it in a cupboard. <laughs> so I haven't used that since. <laughs> so I started a new one with Slater. Yeah. Can't, can't, bear, can't bear to handle it anymore. Sally, it's been, it's been great to meet you and get to know the body of your work i think we'll place you firmly in the middle of the of the bird emergency twitcher bird watcher spectrum that you're experiential but you are maintaining uh, a list do you know your do you know your life number no i don't I don't. There we are. That that means you're certainly not up the extreme end of the <laughs> spectrum. It's not very common that someone has their life number uh, to hand. I haven't got a I clue like what mine is. I used to troll through the field guides and memorise names, species names, Latin names, what they were. I put in all that effort years ago. I, I, particularly young people, I really, if they get right into list and ticking mm. and because it uh, focuses them right in on birds mm. and they're starting mm. to look for detail and looking for points of differences. I think that's a good thing, but it's not what drives me anymore. No, I think it's a beautiful story hearing what everybody likes and looks for a- as part of their hobby. For some of us, it's far more than a hobby. And I always envy people like yourself, Sally, who have been able to build a career being involved with nature i think it's i think you're very lucky people very privileged yeah. grant yeah, yeah. and it's still well, going more to yeah, come th- that's right it really a connection to nature and to uh, the wildlife and the the birds around us should never really end should it should only end one way and that's when it all ends so there we are a touch of morbidity but a sense of joy as well sally thanks so much for being my guest on the bird emergency and i really hope that Our listeners and our viewers have got to know you and 
are far more curious and engaged about the amazing avi fauna of Tasmania, especially the 40 spot. Be the friend of the 40 spotted part of that, everybody. Thanks. See you next time.